Um, well, good evening, everybody. I know we're uh, it's uh, two minutes before 5:30, but I figured uh, it would be as good a time as any to start this meeting off with a pledge. Um, so, if you guys could all stand, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Thanks y'all so much for being here. Um, uh, I appreciate the turnout. If you plan on speaking or asking questions, uh, please just take a moment and go to that table in the back to fill out a form so we have a record of, of who came and who spoke. Um, again, uh, I appreciate y'all being here. My name is Alex Andrade. I'm the state representative here in House District 2. Um, that covers uh, pretty much the city of Pensacola, Scambi County, south of I-10, plus Gulf Breeze, and with redistricting, it goes all the way to the Okaloosa County line. Um, so bigger kind of oceanfront district, but I'm very excited to, to, to be running to go earn everybody's vote again uh, this election. Um, I love doing these in person again. Um, you know, my first uh, two years in office, we got to do a little bit of it uh, before COVID really took over, and then most of these were virtual. So it's exciting to be back. Um, I think my very first one of these was with um, the County Commission District 4 folks for ECUA, the City Council member, and Commissioner Bender. So uh, thank you, Commissioner Bender, for you know, being willing to come and participate in this with me. I know um, there's not anything particularly pressing this evening, um, but it is a good idea always to, to check in with constituents and make sure that we're addressing what y'all need. So um, with that, Commissioner Bender. Uh, thank you, Alex. Welcome, everybody. Appreciate you, you coming out this evening. Uh, first off, I just want to thank um, Escambia County staff for, for getting the, the video. Uh, we are not live tonight, uh, but it will be available uh, for tomorrow. Uh, also, uh, my aide, Angela Crawley, District 4 aide, anyone who's probably called the office is, is familiar with her, and, and we are here to uh, help and address anything that you may have. Uh, we also have our, our acting administrator, Wes Moreno, uh, and I saw... Uh, Wesley Hall walked in, who's our assistant administrator, and I think uh, Debbie's walking in right now. So uh, we have some staff here to, to answer any other concerns uh, and um, look forward to, to taking your questions and comments tonight. So thank you. I mean, uh, I mean with that, uh, I know that there are several people who have things that they do want to ask. Um, uh, so if you have filled out a speaker form already, sorry. Um, if you have filled out a speaker form already, um, Trevor, do you have the microphone? Um, so, this is uh, we're going to start with Roy Skinner. Service Commission. They can investigate what they don't know about. Um, and, and while you know, I want to go and address everything, I'm not omniscient. I can't predict who's who's actually got a, a serious issue. Right. Um, so first things first, you got to submit an official claim to the Public Service Commission. If 
you don't have that information and you haven't submitted a, a complaint to the Public Service Commission about your concern, um, you can contact, you can, you can get in touch with me before I leave tonight and I can give you all the details about who to contact and how. Okay. Second is contact FPL and ask for a usage audit. Um, you know, some people have been dissatisfied with the usage audits that the FPL has provided, but some people have been, been satisfied. Wow. Uh, they, they've gotten information that's actually helped them address the issues that they have. If you are convinced, even after a usage audit and after the complaint gets somehow resolved, that your kilowatt usage is inaccurate, it's got to be based on something, right? So if you are convinced that your kilowatt usage is inaccurate, that's got to mean that your usage is higher than it's ever been before in the house that you've lived in for several, several years. Um, so what I need in order to believe you sufficiently to take official action is a comparison of, you know, your last several years of bills and the kilowatt hour usage to see that you've never reached the same kilowatt hour usage that you are currently. If, if I see that, that's something that I can take official action on. But without that, I can't. But can we, in fact, get that information over several years on solar power and light? These days, they've been very difficult to communicate with. Um, yes, and if, and, if you, and if you struggle figuring that out, contact my office and we can help get you that information. Because I, I personally have not had this problem. I've talked to many, many people who have, people whose bills have been four or more times higher than they were this time last year, with no change in you know, their, their behaviors. People are creatures of habit. They come home from work, they play their games, they watch TV. They don't change it that much. Not, not four times the power bill for that. Okay, so we will have to take and go ahead and do that. I appreciate your answering that question that way. Um, so so there, there's a couple things that I think always get misconstrued about this issue. And I think there are some opportunists who are taking advantage of the confusion about this issue. All right, so FPL, and I can provide the rates. FPL and Gulf Power were two very, very different companies for decades. Gulf Power historically has always had the highest rates in the state of Florida. And I have, the, I have the, the rates on paper. I can show you if you, if you don't believe me. I, they're at the top of this binder right here. Um, FPL has always had the lowest rates. They beat every single municipality, every single co-op in the state. Well, they um, have to be very high right now. No, I'm, I'm aware. I'm aware. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that they're not right now. These are the highest rates we've ever paid in Northwest Florida. All right? Gulf Power was purchased four years ago by FPL. The only thing that's truly changed is the name on the bill. The same people have been running this company for the past four years. So the same people that, that repaired our lines during Hurricane Sally, it was FPL. Um, you know, the same people that have been operating for the past four years have been FPL. Just the names on our bills have been Gulf Power. Um, like this is, this is an issue where you had a perfect storm of a 33-day bill instead of a 30-day bill in January. Do you remember that? Like, I really haven't paid attention to my electric bill in years. I just have to. So, so, so all of a sudden we have to learn lots of things we didn't have to know before. There are two main issues that I've identified in talking with every single constituent who's called me. And by the way, my cell phone number is on my Facebook page. People call me every single day. Um, like I'm very accessible. Um, uh, it's 850-462-4776 for the folks recording in the back. Um, there are two main issues that caused a lot of the problems. First. It's a thing called the inverted rate structure. So we have one water utility here, people's water, that has an inverted rate structure, meaning the more you use after a certain point, the higher the rate for that use. Um, this is the first time in Northwest Florida that we've had an inverted rate structure, and that started in January. Second was a PR nightmare. The first bill that FPL's name was actually on was a 33-day bill, meaning 10% more usage. And as you can recall, if it's a 15 to 20% increase in your rate, percentages matter. So if you have a bill that has 10% more days in it during the highest usage month of the year in January. Yes, sir? One day is not 10% of a 30-day or 33 days. Uh, well, three is 10% is of 30. If you're going from 31 days to 32 days, that is not. No, I said, I said 33. Okay. And people were comparing it to their December bill, which is a 30 day. That, that's what I'm, I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Just, you know, yeah. I mean, you're talking about three more days on a 30 day bill. 
but that's still not four times higher as no. people would experience. No, but it's also the highest usage month of the year, traditionally. But compared to January last year, it's four times higher. That, and that's why I need several years back, mm -hmm. because there might have been years where it was colder than others. Yeah, but, but they're using the, the cold snap as their coverage for all things horrible. That, and that's one other thing. When, when I'm trying to be, when you think I'm playing devil's advocate on this issue, I'm trying to drill down on the actual facts that I need to use to take official action. Right? So, you know, the term devil's advocate is someone whose sole job is to go poke holes in something to make sure that it's verified before you deify a potential saint. Like, that's the purpose of a devil's advocate. So when I ask those questions, what I'm trying to do is poke holes in the arguments right. so that I can determine if there's actually official action I can actually take. Okay. We will get these people on there getting their ears of bills and we will get them to you one hour or another. Okay. Cell phone number. <laughs> really easy. Yes. Just call me. All right, will do, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anything to add? No, I mean, I would just say I'd, I've had the, the same questions and answers. You know, why was there a 33-day period uh, that is 10% longer? Uh, they say it depends on when the billing cycle closes, if there's a holiday. Uh, as he said, the inverted rate structure is that you get that additional surcharge if you go over 1,000 kilowatts. Uh, that's been in place in the state of Florida for decades. It was a way of, of trying to... Uh, incentivize you not to, to go over a thousand hours. Gulf Power didn't have that. I think they were the only one in the state that didn't have that rate structure. Uh, so we had that added. And so my question, I am called Public Service Commission, was, well, if the billing cycle could fluctuate up to three days, 10%, why doesn't that thousand kilowatt hour fluctuate with it? Now, I mean, I think eventually it would, it would even out, but it's a hard pill to swallow when, when we're having this extra 10%. Most of those people probably got the higher rate on that extra 10% because they'd already exceeded 1,000 kilowatts. And so you've now exacerbated something that, um, you know, that, that was new to us. And I understand. And so, uh, you know, uh, I know our, our board is, is looking at sending a letter to the Public Service Commission tomorrow. Uh, I know there are two cases that the Supreme Court is looking at right now regarding the rate increase. Um, the Florida Supreme Court. The Florida Supreme Court, yes, sir. So. Okay. Uh, Mr. John Nixon. Right <clears throat> Alex, you're off the hook, man. Uh, my rates went down in January, so we took some more, but I did feel it was relevant. I'll put a little discussion in mind. Robert, it's all you, man. Okay. I've got, I've got several <coughs> questions from a variety of different people, and um, I don't know if I'm restricted to just one or just I think that would probably be enough for you. We'll cut you off when we're tired of it. Is Hamilton County is either below average or at or near the bottom in the state in many key metrics. Okay. We're talking basic fundamental issues on crime, obesity, um, poverty, uh, reading in third grade, I mean, just there's multiple metrics that we're failing in the state. My question tonight to you is how do you think the commissioners deserve to be paid a 51% premium on their salary in retirement? I hear more about the retirement fund and the suit and the lawsuits and, and the discrepancies and everything else, and I hear absolutely nothing about the metrics that we continue to be failing in for decades, for generations. You came on board four, almost four years ago. What are you doing to make us a safer, a better, a higher ranked county in the state? We have a lot of benefits here. One, the primary is right behind you. We have one of the worst water quality systems in the country. Okay, so it's just a general question. I, I, I wanted to know what if you have those uh, metrics in, in sight and what the strategy might be at the BCC to address them. Thanks. So, well, John, I just want to make sure which, which you want, want me to answer. I mean, I, I think you're asking about the metrics and what we're doing. So, I mean, yeah. we're trying to bring in jobs, right? We're trying to diversify our workforce. We're, we're trying to increase our uh, medium income. Uh, and we, we do economic development. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a number of, of water quality and improvement uh, projects. We have the Pensacola Pretty Debased Program that I'm a member of. 
that, that we're trying to get National Estuary um, Program uh, involvement or become a member of that, that we get some funding from the, from the federal government. Uh, that program has, has gotten, um, uh, including this year, almost $1.2 million that we've done in many grants. Um, and so, of course, we're focused on water quality. Uh, in terms of, of stormwater, we have, uh, we're doing two projects right now in, in the Ferry Pass area uh, that came to light after Hurricane Sally that, that I was not aware of, that was not on any engineering radar or anything like that. So we're adding the um, uh, uh, underground pipe under a Glenbrock Gully um, that uh, I think it's about 45 houses that have a tendency to flood that we're in construction on that right now, um, what, 18 months after Hurricane Sally. Um, we also took uh, Ellison Industrial Pit and actually turned it into a retention pond and it was some of the um, FEMA mitigation, uh, some, some, uh, a, uh, a small area in an adjoining neighborhood had some damage and so as we go in and repair that we're going to also put an additional outflow there to help those houses from flooding. Um, and so I think it's, it's working with our partners. I mean, you talk about obesity. I mean, that's why it was a 5210 program that we do, um, that, that we do across the board, uh, that talks about, you know, number of fruits and vegetables and hours of playing outside and TV time and things like that. Uh, I mean, you have the Children's Trust Fund that's, that's just been established to try to go after some of these children's programs to help with the, with the reading and, and everything. So, uh, I think we are working together with our various boards to help increase that. Um, you know, to talk about the retirement thing, I think it's, it's been political. I think it could have been handled very differently if that was the way it wanted to, wanted to go. You know, when I registered for it, I filled out a form from HR and I submitted it. I didn't tell the clerk what to pay. In fact, I actually went the other way and I said, I think you're overpaying me because HR told me it was going to be a lower percentage. And her staff confirmed that it was going to be the same rate that they were putting into the FRS system for the rest of the commissioners. So that 51% is the same amount, and it wasn't 51 at the time, it was in the low 40s, and I was told it was gonna be in the teens. And so uh, they said, nope, the commission voted in 2014 that, that this is what the rate was gonna be. So all five commissioners, every elected official gets that currently right now, except for the three that are in the 401A program, get 51% of their salary towards FRS. Well, so it is going to be decided in the courts. And so and that's even when it did come up for us to continue having her pay the 51% when that rate adjusted up last year, I voted against that. So she voted for the application as a gift. From a because I don't think the way the clerk went about it is the right way. First she says it was illegal, then she says she never said it was illegal. Do all employees have the same gift? It's to dispute their salaries? All, all elected officials have that same rate. Are the commissioners employees? They're not employees? I, I am an employee. I'm, 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 I'm an employee. You're an elected official. Right. It, it's technically I'm an employee of, of the county. Not really. You're an elected I, I, official. I, that's how it's, it's... That's the structure of the state of Florida that is established for all, all, all elected officials. It's not unique to Escambia County. I, I think 51% is excessive, and that's why I voted against it when, when it was asked to uh, have her continue paying that percentage. But you voted to sue the county to get it to keep No, it was the way she went about it. It's, it's, that's why I voted against forcing her to pay the 51%. Do you think it's ethical for you to accept a pro bono representation from another so, so the uh, so that's a great question. So, there's been a lot of comment about, and I'll, I'll get to you. Uh, there's a lot of question about that. So, what we had to abstain from was that we were asking the county to represent us. Again, the only thing I did was submit a form back to HR that was given to me when I onboarded. I returned that form, and because of that, I was sued. So, I asked. I said, "This is in my official capacity as an elected official." And under our legal representation policy, I asked the county to, to defend me, as it was in my official duties. So that was, the, that was what I was abstaining from, as that it would in, inure me to a special benefit by accepting 
the county representing me. Because we were in this other issue with the clerk, the, that law firm agreed to take us on as clients at the same rate structure that it was that was pro bono. So the gift is actually being given to the county. The pro bono is being given to the county. It's being given to the county. The county can accept a gift. But the county, it's a conflict for the county to have representation against its employees or the county commissioners. So the county can't be the same lawyer for the county commissioners individually and the county representing us, the voters or taxpayers. That, that's not what. Wait, that's a very that's, big yeah, right. legal conflict. That's not, yeah, you want to so, um, so in my day job, when I'm not uh, moonlighting as a politician, I'm a lawyer, and I'm also the, I'm, the, I'm the lawyer for the city of Milton. Um, so, so when you're talking about conflict, um, that would be like a, a Miss Rogers representing both sides. But you have, but you have, you have legal representation and disputes within a county government all the time, and you have to have two completely separate, independent firms and lawyers representing both sides. There's that that privilege that's protected, some type of a you know a separation of information. Um, that's that's all that's occurring here. And as far as uh, the, the gift references, um, uh, commissioners weren't going to have to pay for a lawyer on their own in this circumstance. It was going to be either tax dollars or free. So uh, the, that's that's the benefit that goes to the county is the fact that taxpayer dollars aren't going to pay for an attorney in this in this litigation. No, because the county commissioners are benefiting from this retirement. It's an individual illegal enrichment, which is prohibited under the Florida law. You can accept pro bono services individually or as a county that is going to enrich your friends, family, or anybody. It would apply in any, any circumstances. Your retirement is your personal benefit. So in, in this circumstance, it's a it's a disputed area of law, and that's why it's being turned over. I think the court. ethical commission would disagree. There have been opinions written on this particular thing. A county commissioner or any elected official cannot accept pro bono legal services under any circumstances. Anything over $100 in their, is illegal. In their, in their individual right. capacity. And, and they are in benefiting personally from this retirement law that they pay. So it's, but no, but, but no. it's very clear. I, Understood. I mean, uh, at, at this point, I think we just have to leave. Let, let the courts figure it. Like let the judge figure it out. I, but the, the county commissioner should be very open about what they're spending our tax dollars on. For fiscal conservatives, you're wasting our money on a personal benefit. And even if it is pro bono, even if it's the county attorneys fighting for a retirement benefit that benefits only you three commissioners. Just. Yes. I, I, yeah. Sure. I, I understand. And like, I, like I said, it was it was in place before I, I came in, and 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 so and I I don't I, I do think that fifty one percent is excessive. So I, I think retirement benefits for elected officials. I would uh, defer to you on whether the law would say identify you as an employee. But people who are employed less than five years rarely even get to invest in a employment. You're not guaranteed reelection after four years. And so, but you get to invest in a retirement in the first year you're employed? No one in private enterprise, in private businesses, get to invest in a retirement program and benefit. Okay, thank you. And just so uh, the future, we're just going to try and keep back and forth um, to a minimum, um, just kind of keep this as structured as possible. Um, so, Ms. Dorfman. Thank you. Um, my name is Ron Dorfman, and I represent Tensical Beach Advocates. My question has to do with 5G rollout in Scambia County, and in particular on Pensacola Beach. Um, in meetings with um, county officials and both with SRIA officials, um, both legal counsels stated that in their opinion, if we could remove the word municipality from the state legislation, Florida Statute 760, that uh, there would be a, a possibility that we would not have to put up with the ugly out of place, already fading, wired out, paint chipped, 5G poles on Pensacola Beach. And then after, and so my question is, would you be willing to offer that amendment? And as for all of Escambia County, we also believe that we are not getting the most from our bargaining tools with the telecommunication industry because 
They should be stealthier. They should be concealed. It only costs the industry 30%. And the local ordinance, they say, is a very good one. And so would you be willing to amend the state legislation to remove that word of municipality? Um, because other barrier islands in the state of Florida, um, or one in particular, did so. And or they put the word in, and so they don't have to put up with the ugly fudgy poles on their beaches. So can I ask you one clarifying question about uh, what you uh, are wanting to do? Um, when you say remove municipality, is it your intent to do away with 5G poles and 5G radio waves entirely on the beach, or just to improve the aesthetics and make them comply with like county and city and municipality um, like zoning and, and aesthetic requirements? Well, if other barrier islands in the state of Florida don't have to have them, then we'd like to not have them either. Um, you know, they are, they do not fit in, they're hideous, and just like we have to paint our garage doors out there every year, they are already ugly, faded, wires hanging from the wind and um you know we think that they should have been forced to be co-located um which we know that you know that we all had conversations we just believe that they're leaving a lot on the table and yeah we like to have them removed and if not then why aren't they all being co-located and with stealthier designs so so i appreciate where you're coming from on it because it's not coming from a like a, a fake pseudoscience you know 5g is killing us all it's it's giving us all COVID kind of perspective you're coming from a very practical perspective of you know local governments regulating what they should always be regulating in economic development so um uh, as far as that legislative solution i would say no because by removing municipality what you are essentially going to allow local governments to do is have this patchwork effect where you know, some areas are, are just gonna ban it entirely. They're, they're gonna do away with it out of some of those kind of pseudoscience concerns. Um, 5G radio waves, 5G towers, that technology is gonna be one of the biggest equalizers for this kind of digital divide that we have than of anything that, that we've seen to date. Um, if, if you can think back to at the beginning of COVID when some of our schools were completely remote and everything went online, the massive growth in ed tech, um, in the ability to learn online, it just, it's skyrocketed. Um, it's, a, it's a massive, massive initiative at this point, but the only way for all students of all socioeconomic levels to access it is with things like 5G or something like, you know, Elon Musk, you know, doing his satellites, um, you know, in the future. So as far as inhibiting the rollout of the technology itself, I can't get behind that, and I do know that you will have some pushback from local governments. As far as making companies like Verizon be better neighbors, absolutely. I've, uh, I sent a letter, a very strongly worded letter, early on when this concern was coming out, and I want to continue doing that. So if you have a concern about a specific poll on Pensacola Beach, send me photos and a location, and I'll, you know, as long as I know which company to start chewing out, I'm happy to go help you chew them out. We have provided those photos to Commissioner Bender, and we've negotiated with SRIA, and I'm still waiting for answers from Verizon from me in December 2020. Well, so so the reason I'm asking you to send me is, so at the state level, we write, yeah. well, like we, again, we have the state law. Um, so because it's preempted, local governments, they, they have, their hands are tied in a lot of circumstances like this one. So yeah, please send it to me. The, job, and, the onus is on me to go help address that with you. And you should know that Verizon goes to the uh, least uh, expensive property, they go to the vacant lots, they put them, um, they pick the houses where they think people don't care, and that's where they throw those poles up. And I just challenge you to come to the beach, and yeah, I, I go all the that's time. what it is, so. Hey, Rhonda, thank you. I mean, I know we've been working on this. Um, of course, we're working on trying to get the co-location. Um, I, I think there might be some movement towards that. Uh, we're also looking at some of those stealth designs that, that we talked about what was a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, and I know that um, at Lee's been in, in contact with them. So we look forward to, to working towards a solution for the stealthier designs um, and, and a, a better aesthetics. Joe Nick Uby with Guardian Lytum. I was going to tell it's Joan Irby from Guardian Ed Lighting. First, just in a public forum, I want to thank Alex for doing things even before he was legislative with his bikes. And um, 
just wanted to put it out there that it is Child Abuse Awareness Month. And if you look at the metrics he was talking about earlier, and if you look at the Alice report for Escambia County, it will break your heart because the services for children, the food desert, the cohorts, but I mean, it's a real thing. And we can do, so I have two lives. I'm a realtor, and my passion is guarding that life of foster kids. And we can do everything we want to do to make the community look good, to make the water look good, the beaches are great, but we have this whole group of children, 2,200 in the First Circuit, over 900 here in Escambia County, that are living basically in a third world country life. So until we get behind that as a community, I appreciate Alex, he's always listened to everything I've ever brought to him about things, especially legislatively, that have come up. But as a community with the commissioners, I haven't talked to y'all a lot about this, but we really have got to focus on that because we can do everything we can to make everything look pretty, but people don't want to live in a standing if our schools are bad, if the, you know, my friends in Gulf Breeze when I first started doing this, who lived in Gulf Breeze and I'm like, John, that doesn't affect our kids. And I'm like, yeah, it does, because my kids in the foster care system that end up in the DJJ, are the ones that are going to tell your kids about how to do drugs, how to bring marital sex, tell them all those things you don't want them to know. So until we all get our heads out of the sand and realize that it does affect us, just thank y'all for listening to me because I really don't have a question. I just want to say thank you to both the forum. And we are having a child abuse um, awareness event called the Forgotten Child Event on um, the 22nd of April. So just want to invite y'all all and I'll have some flyers out here. Thank you. Um, Kimberly Garland. Hi. Hi. First thing I want to say is I love these town halls. They are wonderful. Representative Andrade, I really, really want to thank you for the current legislative session and the increase in funding for public education. I appreciate the 50-50 split this year as opposed to the 80-20 last year. I think that our local school board and unions could better negotiate with less requirements. Um, I do know that the Department of Ed is anticipating a 9,000 teacher vacancy starting in August. And I'm wondering what we're looking at to try and help address that. Well, thanks, Kim. That, that was, I think that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. So. I have said a lot of nice things to you. <laughs> Not to my face. No, I'm just kidding. But thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. I appreciate how much you care about your profession. Um, can, as far as addressing the teacher shortage, can I ask you and anyone else in this room who's in the teacher profession um, to do me a favor in the next few months? Is that okay? Yeah. All right, so this is gonna be now, once Governor DeSantis signs this budget, mm -hmm. the third year in a row where we have put over half a billion dollars in towards raising teacher pay mm -hmm. and in, like bringing more people into the profession. Um, I think one big issue, and if I think you were at the teachers <laughs> union kind of you know discussion that I, that I participated in a few months back. Yeah, um, we really appreciate you coming. One thing that I highlighted there was the, the morale issue. Um, you know, I can put $800 million in a budget like we did this year out of respect for the profession that teachers, including my mother who teaches in a public school, are doing. But if the teachers union and their co people's coworkers aren't telling them that that was a good thing and they're telling them that it was actually a slap in the face, it's not going to, to improve morale. So the one ask that I would have is, we funded 800 million additional dollars on top of the categoricals that go towards teacher salaries already. And this is the third year in a row that we've done this. Um, last year, it was $550 million. That was 80% geared towards raising starting teacher pay to $47,500 to draw more people into the profession in response to that teacher shortage. And this is the first year that we're actually funding it at 800 million, 250 million more on top of that additional funding and breaking it from 80-20 to 50-50. So 50% or $400 million is going towards getting 
every single school district in the state onto that path to paying starting teachers $47,500, and the other 50% or $400 million going towards veteran teachers. Um, that is something that I think if we were all on the same page and celebrating that, saying this is not a, not a slap in the face, it's actually a, a sign of appreciation and respect, and you know everyone agrees that the teaching profession is a profession that should be respected, appreciated, and celebrated, I think it would go a long way towards fixing the morale issue that I, I see day to day when I talk to teachers. Okay. The 50-50 is a little easier to sell. When y'all did the 80-20, I'm a 20 plus year veteran teacher. Okay. I have been through these salary freezes. I have been through all of that. And then, okay, wow, we want to give more of a raise to all of these brand new teachers that you have to mentor because they're just learning. That is the people that were saying, man, I feel like this is a slap in the face. And I have done my best to try and keep morale up where I'm working. But we lost several veteran teachers today, this year, during the school year. And when I first started teaching, you never saw teachers leave during the school year. They might not come back the next year, but they didn't yeah, so just, just leave. One, just one quick question. Um, because the, this was additional funding outside the categorical that was never negotiated with the union or teachers in the past. So teachers had already negotiated, they knew exactly what their salary was going to be the next year, mm -hmm. and then we as the legislature, after that negotiated, uh, negotiation had occurred, for veteran teachers said, we're going to fund $100 million, essentially 20% of that 550, $100 million towards unnegotiated teacher raises, and we hadn't set aside $400 million to draw more people into the profession, which is what the union told me was the big issue, the teacher shortage. If I if I'd not funded that $400 million and just paid that $100 million to pay teacher veteran teachers above what they negotiated to work for, would that have been a slap in the face? What would have been better is if y'all hadn't categorized it to one or the other and let the local school boards put it where they really needed it. I mean, personally for me, I've been desperate for ESPs all year long. So, hey, I would be all about, let's give them ESPs more money, but that's just me. Well, our base student allocation has gone up every year in addition to that separate funding, so um, we are doing everything we can to go address those issues. I would just, and if I we really want to thank you for what you have done. If we could I love on. these town halls, and I'm going to come to everyone I can. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Aaron S. And just a reminder, we're going to try and keep the back and forth to a minimum so we can get out of here. Okay, so I wanted to, my name's Aaron Schneier. Um, I wanted to read uh, scripture real quick. This is from Psalm 139, 13 through uh, 16. So it says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So God is telling us that he knits us together in our mother's womb and that um, that our days were formed uh, for us uh, even before any of them existed. So the, the topic that's on my heart and a lot of people's hearts here in Florida is abortion. And um, we want to see it ended no matter what. No, we don't. Um, no, we don't. And we don't. so... We don't. No, we don't. It, the, so it says, what I'm saying is I'm asking you to put forth a bill to outlaw abortion in Florida and not to worry about how the legislators later is going to take it, but just to do it because God makes babies. So I'm asking you to do that and not to worry about the opinion of people. We don't have, we don't have 
have to answer it to them when we die. That's it. Uh, Mary Williams. Um, it's for Representative Andrade. Um, all throughout the session, you were um, you supported um, a bill that would eliminate permanent alimony. How do you think that the elimination of permanent alimony will help children and families in your pro-family agenda? That's just one of those. I yeah, no, thanks that. for the question. Um, so, uh, uh, pellet courts in Florida for over a decade have been asking the legislature to fix our statute because unlike child support, which is formulaic right now, and has essentially eliminated the majority of litigation over the calculation for child support, like you know exactly where child support's going to be calculated based on the incomes and provable information. Unlike that, in the alimony context, we set up a circumstance where we incentivize litigation between, between former spouses. So um, my favorite kind of uh, way to put people in like the mindset of exactly how this goes is in criminal court, in criminal court, and some of, some of y'all have experience in criminal court in this room, um, you see bad people in their best days. In divorce court, you see good people on their worst days, in the worst circumstances of their life. So when you go through a divorce, one, alimony is separate than child support. Child support was not affected at all by this bill. So uh, any, any talk about me like taking away funding from, from children is just a lie. Second, alimony itself, oh, I don't, child support's not affected at all. I can point to the statute. Um, second is, alimony is calculated after the couple's worldly assets are divided in the equitable distribution. So everything you've accumulated as a couple, if you were a stay at home and the other person worked, everything you accumulated, your house, your cars, boats, second homes, whatever you have, jewelry, anything, it gets valued. And then the judge divvies it up 50-50 at worst for the non-income producing spouse. That's, that's the equitable distribution, that's how Florida law works. Alimony is money earned after these two people are no longer married. So in Florida, because we have no framework at all, a spouse who wants to push, uh, you know, a lawsuit to try and, you know, stick it to their other spouse, they're spending their worldly assets together, burning their worldly assets down in litigation, where lawyers are the only ones winning over money that hasn't been earned yet. So setting up the formula to match it to child support, where we've seen the effect of eliminating lawsuits and child support. Setting up alimony the same way we already have child support set up was just a way to, one, help good people know exactly what their results would be if they took it to trial so they wouldn't waste that money and lawyers wouldn't win as much. Like that was, like this was, that was the intent and that's the effect you, of the bill. Do you really believe that the government involving itself in a marital contract is what your party stands for? Man, the, the chapter's already there, it's just poorly written. I'm fixing, it was fixing the chapter. It's not like we're, we're, we didn't expand the size and scope of government, we just fixed it. One other question. You, during your legislative session, um, did you support the governor's plan to limit voting rights for um, the entire state, HB 90 and all? Where did you stand on that? And did you witness any voter fraud that would justify this legislation? So, one, I challenge the premise of the question. Um, no, I, I don't support ever disenfranchising anyone's right to vote. The right to vote is sacred. The right to vote is so sacred that we need to make sure that it's being dealt with appropriately, that it's being administered appropriately and legally. Um, so yeah, you do have uh, a large portion of the state of Florida that has concerns about voter integrity, not just in the state, but across the country. And so, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I think I would ask you first and foremost, what policy specifically in whatever bill that you made that conclusion about you, you believe disenfranchises voters, especially in a state like ours, which has more voting days than the majority of blue states. I'm asking you if in this region, you would support restricting voter access. No, absolutely not, never. Like uh, the right and to vote is sacred. that's exactly what the bill does, the law does. It no, we disagree about the interpretation of the bill. Voter access. We disagree about the interpretation of the bill. Have you witnessed any voter fraud in this region, in the uh, Panhandle region? Um, you have to be more specific. Any voter fraud that would justify this? Yeah, there, there's been several instances of voter fraud in the state of Florida and across the country. No, I'm asking in this region, in the San Diego County, in your region. 
Uh, well, well, no, ma'am, I'm not a police officer or an investigator. But again, like, like, like alimony, where the statute's already there, and it's our job to make sure that it's good, and if there are issues with it, we fix it. It's the same with the statute on administering elections. That's one of our roles. So to make sure that we're administering our elections as well as we possibly can, and providing that, that comfort to make sure that everybody understands that our elections are appropriately being calculated and run is absolutely part of my job. Do you feel like the uh, South Florida sham candidate deal, Sir, uh, dark money, was part of our question. Um, so, Deshaun McKenzie, next. Hi, my name is Sean McKenzie. I'm with the Zambia Educators Association. Uh, most of my questions actually are going to answer what we um, talked about the uh, teacher vacancies. I did um, have a follow up comment, I guess, though, from that original discussion. Um, to follow up with um, what's mentioned already is as I'm as a young teacher, I'm not only three years in the profession, who has been trained by my veteran teachers. Without veteran teachers, I might be a profession by myself. Um, you know, the 80 20 switch and 50 50 split on the market was helpful. But our union, in Sandy County specifically, our union is having um, trouble fighting for, for wages for us. Even when money is allocated, it's really difficult to negotiate that when a lot, when there's a lot of red tape on Tallahassee. I think home rule would really help our, help our district, help our uh, county be able to better help the teachers get more money. Um, especially, as you mentioned, there's, you know, there's other issues besides just base teacher salaries. I'm, and I, yeah, I, as a young teacher, I appreciate the salary going up because that's what's keeping me in the profession. But I see my veteran teachers who are 10, 15 years in the profession, whose salaries, because of the salary freezes years ago, also went up when intro, uh, entry level salaries went up, because they were also under that threshold. So, so, so first and foremost, um, there's no veteran teacher that's making less than a starting teacher in the state. Like uh, that, that doesn't occur. If anyone thinks that's occurring, I promise no, you it's no, not. I, 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 I know you're not. Yeah, so, not so, less than, than less than yeah, starting teacher, but they um, still under that threshold. We the, the, one, the one thing I would want to address in what you said is, is as a three-year teacher who I'm gonna guess, wild guess, you're making less than 47,500 right now, yeah. right? Okay, so um, your pay raise should have been automatic at the beginning of last school year. The reason it wasn't is because of negotiations, not for you, because your pay raise to get to 47,500 was supposed to be put on a fast track. It was designed to solve one problem, which was the teacher shortage, to draw more people into the profession. Your pay raise was held up because of negotiations between the union and the school district. Veteran teacher pays it pay raises were the reason that that whole negotiation fell apart and almost went to an impasse. Starting teachers and teachers making below 47.5, their raises are supposed to be on a fast track until they get to that. That is, that is the goal that we're all supposed to be getting to. After every school district gets to that, they get to use that money however they see fit. Um, the goal is to get at that one goal resolved, meet that one goal, and then give school districts and unions all the wiggle room they want to negotiate on how to use that money after that. Okay, I, I don't want to start with the rules back and forth, but I do want to say like, I, the reason I think that the account of the district itself should have more control over how the money is spent. And again, I appreciate my grade was supposed to be fast track, but at least in my school, the schools that I've seen, there's way more veteran teachers than our young teachers, especially because we, we are, and I know the grades are the attract more young teachers to our county, but like, I was a school leader and I've been looking at other counties because they pay better. But it's also for our veteran teachers. I see veteran teachers walking out the door. The same people who would who make my job a little easier because I'm brand new. If we have a school full of brand new teachers, that's great. But if those veterans walk out, we're going to be a lot of those who lost. And I think the negotiations being held up by veterans doesn't bother me because I think those veteran teachers needed need better uh, need better raises. And you know, with the 50-50, hopefully it'll, it'll come a little better in the coming years. But the like I said, our county has more veteran teachers than rookie teachers. So focusing primarily on the rookie teachers leaves a lot of our veterans out to dry and leaves them wanting to walk out and go do other jobs or have to work second and third jobs when 20 years into a profession they should have to do that. Thank you. Uh, Miller Bonin. I'm uh, Miller Bonin. I've been living in Pensacola since 1982. I want to offer you some information that I calculated based on the calculated for the Florida Power and Light energy rates as I see them. And I'm offering this because I have deep concerns about the Public Service Commission's performance monitoring this merger. Uh, what I've done is I have 
calculated my average monthly consumption based on the 12 month period ending January 2022. I took that monthly energy consumption, I applied the Florida power and light tier rates to project what my power cost would be for the forthcoming year. And I came out to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Contrary to what everybody is reporting to you, including Florida Power and Light, that is the 14th highest rate in the country based on information from the U.S. Energy Information Association. Okay? So using a 1,000 kilowatt hour, if you go to Florida Power and Light's webpage, you'll see that they say, here's your rate for 1,000 kilowatt hour, which is ridiculous. Very few homes and establishments consume less than 1,000 kilowatt hours. But anyway, my analysis comes out to 15 cents per kilowatt hour, and that excludes taxes, franchise fees, and the base energy charge. Now, I have heard elected officials say most of this increase is due to fuel. Bull. In my calculation, only 23% of that was due to the fuel charge. 77% of that increase was due to what is called the energy charge, which you probably know includes pass-throughs for things like environmental projects, uh, infrastructure improvements, storm and wind damage. I mean, they, they can run projects inefficiently and we pay for them. So, my point is we have some of the highest rates in the country and my my concern is with the Public Service Commission. They are supposed to represent both entities. They're supposed to help Florida Power and Light ensure a return on equity, and by God, they got it. So the only, re the only difference between what I see going forward and what I had in the past is the merger, and that's a 30% increase. That, and I'm not even, I'm not concerned with uh, all, this, all the other comments about inaccurate metering and this and that. This, these are facts, and, 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 and that to me, that 30% uh, increase just is, is, is just not, not fair. And, and, and because sir, this is not a free market capitalistic system. Not, okay, not. This is a monopoly. Mm -hmm. right. That's the other thing I have. Why do we allow this to go through? This is strictly a monopoly, but that's where the PSC comes in. They're supposed to make sure well, that the consumers have a fair. So I think we do need another rehearing. Can I answer your question? Sure. Okay, so the Public Service Commission, no, their, their job is not to represent both sides. They're, they serve as judges. They represent neither side. Their job is to enforce the law. The job of the public counsel, Richard Gentry in the Office of Public Counsel, they're the agency that sues utility companies. It's their job to represent us. They're our, they're our counsel. So you have the Office of Public Counsel, excuse them. So you have the Public Service Commission serves like a five panel judge slash jury. They weigh all the facts during a rate case. It's called a rate case for a reason, it's a trial. They review that, they issue an order. After a certain amount of time, they don't get to re-review that order. It would be like a circuit court judge reviewing an order they'd already issued. That's why it's on appeal to the Florida Supreme Court. So you have the Florida Supreme Court now, who's the only, only entity in the state with any jurisdiction over this rate unless there's a triggering factor in the next four years, because this rate is set, the, the, the rate plan is set for the next four years. The only thing that's, that's out of control right now is whether or not we have hurricanes, and whether or not we have shifts in natural gas that would significantly alter the rate. But the rate set, we know exactly, I can predict the future, I know exactly what the rate's gonna be next year, the year after that, and the year after that. Um, Unless the Florida Supreme Court overturns those rates, those are going to be the rates. Anyone telling you that they can change it is, is selling you a bag of goods to try and get you to stop yelling at them. Like, those are the facts. Like, if, if I lose people's faith, if I lose people's votes because I'm telling them the truth, I'll go back home, make more money, and spend more time with my wife and dogs here and down. Like, that's a fact. It's like changing a jury verdict. That's not me being non-empathetic that's me not lying to you. So if you want to fully understand exactly what those facts were that went into the rate all last year, because there were 12 public hearings, 
This information was laid out. They were sued by Richard Gentry in the Office of Public Counsel, and the rate was finalized and approved by the Public Service Commission. If you want to know exactly all the details that went into that, I will spend all the time in the world with you. And if you have an issue with how you're... I've read every bit of it. Okay? So you understand that it's, that it's a jury verdict. Uh, what I don't understand is what you just said. There's nothing that can be done? No. I mean, are you telling me that going forward, I've got to accept whatever this public service... And this public... Oh, no, no, no. If you want, if you want to talk about uh, the monopoly system in, in Florida, I'd love to talk to you about that. If you want to talk about policy changes, but those are long-term and short-term conversations. I can't change our monopoly system in Florida, one, by myself, two, overnight. Um, the monopoly system's been established for over 100 years. I just want the, I just want the Public Service Commission. And this council you're talking about, I read about that, too. But the Public Service Commission is a big elephant in the room. Well, they're the judge. Yeah, they made the call. They, they, they made the call. And they did not serve. But the call the now consumers. is at the Florida Supreme Court. They're the ones that are sitting there. They're the ones that are making the call. They're the panel in control right now. Nobody else. And you don't want politically elected officials like me trying to influence the Florida Supreme Court. I, I mean, like, raise your hand if you do. Like, do you want me to interfere with judicial decisions no. as, a, as a partisan elected no, official? No, that's not the point. The judicial should go to bat for us. I do. I want you to I'm, and, 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 that's, and that's what I'm saying. And that's what I'm saying. If you are convinced that something is wrong in the calculation. That's not what I'm asking you, right? No, nothing's wrong. It's not. Wrong. And I, again. Nothing's wrong in the calculation. Again. If, some people are convinced that their calculation is wrong and want to go help them investigate <laughs> that. The fact, and I, a 30% increase just because Florida Power and Light bought gold. That is the only thing I can conclude. Well, uh, did you also go back? Like We've had the highest rates in the state of Florida for decades. Who has? Gulf Power, Northwest Florida's had the highest. Gulf Power is ready to throw us into the kilowatt hour and it's flat. Uh, I, can, I have right. the, sorry, I have the historical data. <laughs> Yeah, is Mr. Skinner still here? One one seven nine, and it's flat. Hey, well, Mr. S Mr. Skinner, if you got that document, somebody just asked for it. All right. Uh, well, we do that, uh, Carolyn Brownlee. Who 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 demanded the the documentation? Thank you, Mr. Skinner. Hi, um, Representative Andre and Commissioner Bender. You know, I'm Carolyn Brown, so I'm for independent living. We work with people with disabilities. We appreciate the work that you do on our behalf to try to, to make access and inclusion in schools throughout the state and throughout our county here. Um, what I do want to uh, speak to just briefly is that we've had the Air Act money that's been here, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program that's been going through both the county and throughout Florida. What we have been hearing from some of the folks with disabilities is that this money, of course, we know is going to rental, renters. What else can we see and be done to change some of the policy that's with some of that money so that we can help that get to people who are homeowners who are experiencing problems from COVID or, or post COVID with changes in jobs, things like that, that are happening for folks who have increases both in their power or inability to pay their mortgages? Because we're having people come to our office who are saying that. Um, they're going to lose their homes. We have people who have been in their homes for 50 years who are losing their homes, who can't afford it, who don't have power, who don't have power for oxygen, who don't have power for their wheelchairs, etc. And so it's a concern. Just sharing that information. So the, the funding for those services comes from eight different sources. I mean, for affordable housing, you're, you can talk about ship or sale. You can talk in generalities about the Sadowski Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which the state funded, by the way, this year. Um, like there's, there's a plethora of different, you know, pots of money <coughs> that come with different strings. Um, so, so an overarching solution, asking, uh, uh, you know, I'm a state house member, one of 120. Um, I can't, I can't tell you this is how it's going to get fixed. But if you have one specific policy or program that you want tweaked, yeah, put me in, coach. Like I'll, I'll go work with you, Carolyn, and go work on. So again, Air Act is for renters, and so I, it would be nice if there was something that was there for homeowners. But, but that's why I brought up Sadowski and Ship and Sale. Like there, there's other pots of money that are available for other things. Um, like a, it's just it, that's a partially federally funded program that has its own strings that I can't change. But that doesn't mean I can't help with the issue you're bringing it up. Uh, B.J. Brunius. 
Um, just a reminder, we have the room till 7 p.m., so try to keep your comments short. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, you represent uh, a small area of Gulf Breeze as well. I know it's on Pensacola people, but I'm from the Gulf Breeze area. And so we have an affordable housing issue, not only in Pensacola, but in Santa Rosa County as well. It's very expensive to live in Gulf Breeze. And I think no matter whether you live in Warrington or East Hill or Gulf Breeze, all Floridians deserve the freedom to be able to go to work, have a decent job, make a decent living, put food on the table, and by God, be home in time to eat it with your families. But today we have like politicians who are selling off our land to wealthy developers, to the highest bidder. They're roaming through our communities, tearing down our forests. They're causing flooding in areas that never flooded because the swamps are gone. And so we need to figure out why is it that consistently Republicans who used to actually stand up for Americans and stand up for Floridians are now on the side of the corporations. When did that happen? That has happened in this area. We no longer have a party who consistently stands on the side of Floridians and of the people who live here. But you want to keep blaming Democrats. You're a Republican. Michelle Salzman's a Republican. J.R. Williamson's a Republican. Doug Broxson's a Republican. The county commission in Santa Rosa County, they're all Republicans. The mayor of Gulf Breeze is a Republican. The city council is a Republican. You all are all Republicans, but you want to blame Democrats for the reasons that we have problems here. And that just doesn't fly. But there's a reason why you all do it. Because you want us all fighting with each other. Because when we're fighting with each other, we're not paying attention to what the politicians in Tallahassee are doing. And that needs to end. We all need to, you haven't answered a single question. Every time somebody asks a question, you talk about how, I don't know what I can do. Uh, I'll try and look into that. that. That's all we're getting here. And so there has to come a point in time where we elect leaders who not sow division in our communities. You know Gulf Breeze Elementary School is not teaching children about sexual intercourse in, fifth, in third grade. It's a question. You, it is a question. Sir, sir, you know yeah, that. Sir, I'm going to get to the question. So you know that, that Gulf Breeze Elementary School teachers are not teaching children about intercourse as five-year-olds. But what you want to do is you want to divide us. You want to divide us so that while poor politicians in Tallahassee are making those backyard, those, those backroom deals to, to have these developers come through our communities, do you know how long it takes to get to work now? There's no investment in our infrastructure, our roads, expanding our highways to accommodate these 500, 700,000. We're running out of time. Uh, okay, so the question is, so the question is, at what point are Republicans going to stop and get out of the pockets of the corporations and into the pockets of the people? Uh, okay, so, so. I'm glad I finally get to meet you, Mr. Brunius. I recognize your voice, right? Uh, we make Florida. You're the guy that makes kind of the. That wasn't the, my question. But, question. but no, just just to confirm, just uh, that that's you, right? Um, so um, one, I have a sneaking suspicion that no matter what I say, it's not going to satisfy you. But what I will say is, I don't want to be in the pockets of corporations or the people. I want to be as out of the out of the way of the people in this community as possible. That's the government philosophy that has worked. That, like the, the ability for people to go support their families, to go get the education, get access to the professions without interference from the government, is how you establish that generational wealth that actually helps people survive and improve. Now, as far as the flooding issue, Chris Kerb knows, I'm one of the staunchest supporters. I'm a flood defender. I support, I support flooding infrastructure, and actually I brought record money home from Tallahassee for those initiatives, for water quality initiatives, for separate sewer, sewer programs, for better LIDAR mapping so we can actually understand our flooding platforms to address flooding issues better here in Northwest Florida. Um, uh, you might want me to be a divisionist jerk of a human being, but I'm here in front of you unabashedly happy to talk about the work that I'm doing because I care about it, and I'm proud of it. Um, no. I would have much rather everybody who opposed the, the parental rights and education bill to have just read the seven page bill because it would have taken two minutes to pass and if you think it's harmless, it would have remained harmless. 
Uh, I'm not trying to be divisionist. In fact, I'm trying to unite folks. That's why, again, I'm here, and I'm not asking people's party affiliation before they answer questions or, or make creepy, weird, we make Florida videos of me or you know, do anything else, because, again, I'm not offended by the work that you're doing on, on behalf of progressive Democrats. I want to work with you. I don't want you to think I'm a bad person. I'm happy to spend all the time you want after this event. Uh, you can berate me for another 30 minutes. I'm happy to talk with you. Like, if there's things that we can work on, I'm happy to work on them with you. I just can't do it if you're shouting at me and not engaging with me on an actual issue. Um, so, no, I can't be all things to all people. But I'd love to work with you. Uh, Sarah Setter. So, we have nine speakers left. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sarah Seta, and I'm a stagehand here in Pensacola. I deal with a lot of um, shows coming in and out, a lot of people that work these shows coming in and out. We are all poor. When COVID happened, our shows were done. We had no work. We had no income, no nothing. Yeah, you know, all that stuff that happened with uh, the Florida reemployment stuff. The question I'm asking is, since we were poor then and we're poor now, Things are coming back slowly, but we're still poor. How, how can you expect some of our, our, our co-workers to pay a $964 bill in January for FPL, a $1,032 bill in February for FPL, and a $624 bill in March for FPL? It's very difficult, and it's putting everyone in a bind. How can we, together, as a group, fix this so that everybody is paying a proper amount because anything over $500 for a single month, especially when it's not cold and not bitter, is very difficult, and it's very confusing, and it's very frustrating. Thank you very much. Uh, so that, that bill was, was that for a corporation or for a resident? Like for uh, a, sorry, it was for a residents and the people that work for us, with us, in the city. So it's a one single resident? Um, this particular situation that I'm talking about is one single resident, but it's not the only resident. Okay, it's not the only but no. Resident. So, so what I would what I would ask you to do is have that one person with a thousand dollar bill just contact me. Absolutely. We'll do that again. Uh, Doctor S. I couldn't read the last name. Strong. Yes. Hi. I just wanted to let you know that I've been in this till for 64 years. My average kilowatt hours is 340 to 520, rarely over 600. Last month, no change in my behavior, 1,200 kilowatt hours. And I have neighbors whose bills, like mine, went from $100 to $600. We don't have children. There's no one running up our bills, our habits haven't changed, but our bills have either doubled or tripled. Do you, do you have your, your bills with you? Since 2011. Great, so can, can we just meet up afterwards so we can go over them? Because if you're telling me, I don't know how many times I have to repeat myself. If you're telling me that the, your usage has, has gone up beyond what is reasonable, I want to help you investigate that. I want to investigate that with you. Like, uh, like, I can't, no, I can't change a jury verdict. I can't change the rate. But if you believe that your usage is being incorrectly calculated, that is something that absolutely we need to work to address. And I'm on, like, I want to help you as much as I possibly can to address it. Uh, Dan Casey. Uh, Bayou Grand State Park. Uh, Diana Redleski. Um, I'm not speaking, I just took okay. the card. <laughs> and then Chris Kerb. Yeah, I uh, really appreciate y'all for having this. Um, kind of obvious <laughs> these things are great. Um, when you're at commission, I need to do them three minutes, but uh, I'll try to keep it. Uh, I'm with Flood Defenders. Uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. And um, our whole goal is to help flood victims uh, advocate for better flood protection. 
Uh, we got, we really have four principles. It's need a good plan. Uh, got to have land development codes that protect people. You got to invest. You got to invest money in, in infrastructure. And uh, you need to maintain and repair what we have. Um, I really appreciate uh, your support. Um, I want to make sure I get these numbers right. Um, House Bill 53, House Bill 70, uh, 70, 53, and I don't think that you're on the House, so, but Senate Bill 1954 was actually how House Bill uh, 70, 70, 53 came out. It's all about flooding, uh, statewide flooding and sea level rise resilience bill is what just passed. I appreciate your support on that. Flood Centers, thanks for that. And the American Flood Coalition. Um, the always ready legislation basically set up funding for the state of Florida. And Governor DeSantis just recently uh, awarded, I believe it was $403 million to municipalities. The problem is the Panhandle only got 9% of that. Uh, Miami-Dade County, they, they got millions of dollars. And uh, I want to know what the Panhandle municipalities need to do to get that money. I, I already know some of the answers to that, but uh, we need to get more of that funding up here to flood, you know, to fix flooding problems. Um, House Bill 53 has a, a requirement that the counties have, municipalities have a 20 year water, uh, stormwater plan and a wastewater plan. I don't know what ECUA is doing, but uh, I know Santa Rosa County is trying to get theirs together. Scammy County's had a plan since 2015, but they only fund $4 million a year annually to do local option sales tax for drainage. So, not much. So getting grants is the way to take the money that the municipalities have to expand that. And uh, I'd just like to know what you'd have to say, what you would recommend to your commissioners here, how do we get that money here? Uh, so first and foremost, um, yeah, anytime we kind of uh, bemoan getting a smaller amount of money from the state than Miami. It, it helps to remember that we have like less than one fifth, one tenth, one twentieth of the population. Um, so 9% of that pot of money is actually pretty good for our population size. It's probably broken out pretty fairly per capita. What I would say is um, like a, what you need between your state legislators and your local government officials is a good, active, working, healthy communication relationship, uh, which I believe that we do. Uh, like, I, you got me and Commissioner Bender here tonight, me and Commissioner Bergash and May and Barry. We all have great communication skills. And in fact, even me and Commissioner Underhill um, on most good days have good communication as well um, when, he, when he's not ticked off at something I'm doing. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, um, having that healthy relationship between state and local is the way to maximize your ability to get those funds. And we've had a ton of wins. I mean, like, uh, with the West Florida Water Management District um, a few years back. This was a, a Gulf Breeze water quality thing, Mr. Brunius. So I sat down with the city of Gulf Breeze and the county of Santa Rosa and Eglin Air Force Base and the Water Management District and Senator Broxton's office and my office in Tallahassee and said, we have a grant opportunity. There's a water reuse funding and we need a new water treatment facility in Santa Rosa County. If Gulf Breeze is willing to buy the water reuse water, the reused water, instead of spraying it out at Eglin. We could suddenly get $10 million from the state to fund our water treatment facility in Santa Rosa County, meaning Santa Rosa County doesn't have to spend that $10 million to fund that water treatment facility on the south end of the county. So by simply getting everybody at the table and getting Gulf Breeze to agree, yeah, like our sprinklers, they can use reused water. Um, we got $10 million extra dollars towards a project that was gonna need to be built anyway, and we avoided spray fields at Eglin. Um, like it's those opportunities that get me excited about this job. That and like when a constituent calls my cell phone and they do it every day, but like at the end of the day, all it takes is that organic ability for me to like pick up the phone and know when I talk to Robert or Wes or anybody else in the county, 
I can trust that they've done their research, they know their role, and that they're in it for the right reasons to help their constituents. So to sum up what you just said, it's all about we the people and not me the people. 100%. Everybody needs to communicate together, get along with each other. Um, this gentleman right here is talking about the vision. I, I think that is a uh, national problem that, that's going on, but I, on a local level, I don't see it. But so we've had some national flood defender folks come down, and it was Robert who got his SUV after I called him. We we picked these guys up from the airport, and we took them around the county, did an assessment. Grover met us too, the city. Um, uh, at, right now, the biggest issue, and I think some of you guys might be familiar with the term, the tyranny of the urgent. Um, we have a massive rainfall every few years, and you know a, a neighborhood gets flooded. And that's a big issue for four weeks. How could we let this happen? What happened here? Why did we fund this project? Why don't we fix this program? And then two months go by, the flooding's receded, obviously. Those, those people are going through their FEMA or insurance fixes. And suddenly the, the topic du jour at county commission, city council, and my phone is something completely different than flooding. Flooding's not sexy, right? But we need to be investing as a state. But it starts at the state. Louisiana's been eating our lunch for decades. At the state level, it's only been the past two years that the state of Florida has been prioritizing, saying, listen, we know that flooding is becoming an issue. We've got king tides in South Florida. By the way, Escambia County, you've had three um, you know, massive floods in the past decade for some homes, and that's absolutely unacceptable. It affects property values, it affects our economy overall. That's something that has to not be you know, a victim of the tyranny of the urgent. That has to be a priority day in and day out. Um, so if you, if you care, if you, if you say you care about that stuff, make that a wedge issue for the people that you're voting for. Like make, make that a serious issue that, that helps decide who you're going to vote for. It is my issue to vote for you. <laughs> I, I will tell you, uh, I'm going to reflect the whole issue and put some uh, other uh, legislation. Well, assuming I get sent back, I'll have seven slots. So, <laughs> hey, yeah, Chris, like I said, I touched on some of those projects that we've we've done relatively quickly. Uh, you know, I've, I've met you out there at constituents' homes uh, because uh, I want to see what's going on, and I also want to, to push it. So, uh, even though uh, maybe those phone calls do stop, we're still pushing those projects, and that's why we're we got construction going on right now. Um, I also want to say, um, you know, the county very recently hired a resilience manager. Um, and uh, they're, of course, the focus on Pensacola Beach and other hot spots. Uh, so as we look at those rising uh, sea levels and things like that. So that is something that we are working toward right now. What about the county building uh, zones and enforcing, allowing developers to build I, 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 I just want to make sure we get to everybody. I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you after. I just want to know. It's the yes, same question. I mean, accountability by the county commission. Can you just say your name for us? Hi, my name is Terry Goodwin. Uh, Commissioner, I'd like to thank you for your prompt response today on my storm water drainage issue that I experienced when I want you to drive. It's been going on since I moved in and it has deteriorated the sidewalks and the driveways of people who are affected. But I got a very prompt response from your office today and I sincerely appreciate that. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And and you know, uh, right after Hurricane Sally, I did hold the town hall out there and that was the, the focus. Nobody brought your area to, to light, and so much like with the, what we're doing with the Gatewood Ditch and, and doing that, we'll we'll try to address and what I we can. This big orange thing that looks like a Lego box, you know, you put Legos on it, the bumps on it, but it doesn't drain anything. Sure. And so I'm sure that's part of the problem that we supply. The rest of my comments are for you, sir. Um, I'm here because of Florida Power Light. What has transpired for the panhandle is a major atrocity for Monopoly to gain so much from so few, but the benefit of the entire nation they support. We are paying for their infrastructure improvements nationwide. What better choice to pick than the little Florida panhandle? I am very pleased to see that most of the municipalities, the city of Milton, the city of Callaway, the city of Gulf Breeze, Santa Rosa County, Escambia County, 
Skinny County Commissioners and Pensacola City Council have sent letters representing our request, and it's, it's a request, but something needs to be looked at to stop this hostage situation we come into. I, had, I lived in Gulf Breeze for 27 years. I never had a power bill in a 2,800 square foot home go over 1,000 kilowatt hours, never. I lived, I moved back to Pensacola in 2015, had a what, 2,800 square foot four bedroom house, blasted the AC, had an older HVAC, had a hot tub, never went over 1,000 kilowatt hours. I moved back just recently after retiring from the state of Florida, and I rent right now, so I'm helpless as to what I can and cannot replace. But when I heard that uh, my bills with Gulf Power when I moved in were between 93 kilowatt hours and 855 kilowatt hours, that was my maximum usage. And those were during months I was moving in, had the air conditioning blasting, and had the doors wide open. So there was no conservation of anything going on at that time, I promise you because it was hot. But when Florida Power and Light took over, all of a sudden, my bill jumped to 1,682 kilowatt hours. I, hadn't, I had changed everything in preparation for that on January 1st, actually December 31st. I had my Christmas lights outside, but I cut off my HVAC totally at the breaker. I made sure I wasn't using the dishwasher. I only wash clothes every two weeks. It's just me, so it's not that much laundry. I didn't use the dishwasher. I conserve energy to the best of my ability. All LED lights and everything that lights up. Ma'am, have you submitted a complaint to the Public Service Commission? I have tried to call several times, and I have filled out a form, but I have not heard back. Okay, I so have written to the governor. I have written to the Public Service Commission. But let me finish, sir. Let me just finish my little diet right okay. Bear with me. Okay. What we're asking for is, number one, we went to the city council asking for a feasibility study. Northern Escambia County has a co-op. That works very well for them. I moved back here from the city of Tallahassee, which was a city owned utility. It included everything on my bill, and my bill was never higher than 280 a month. Water, sewer, gas, trash, fire, electric, everything. But, you know, in preparation for the takeover of FPL, I took precautions to make sure I was going to conserve and not get held hostage. It didn't do me any good. I mean, what we're asking for is some proactive action to maybe have to come from the legislature to the governor, to the PSC, to do a forensic audit, a full forensic audit of Florida Power and Light, and let's just see what's really happening. They are making almost 11% profit on their bills that they bill us. They are a monopoly, as one gentleman so stoically mentioned, and it's just not fair to the do rest you, of us. There are people, do you want me to? I'm not done. <laughs> the PSC has, the, the agreement has not been signed on the dotted line by all the people involved. So there is time to read the settlement agreement. At what point does FPL and NextEra stop passing on their improvements, which appear to cover all areas they serve? That's a cost of this doing business. That's part of their GNA, their, their cost allocation, general ledger stuff. But they have to absorb some of that. Yes, they can pass some of that on, but not pass it all on. Uh, I have turned, I've told you before, I've turned everything off. I have a hot water on timer. I mean, I don't do anything. I have sweat to death when it's hot, and I have frozen when it's cold and just keep layering and layering and layering. We should not have to change the way we live our lives to accommodate the ability to pay an electric bill. And, and I am just furious over this. I, I fully support any efforts anybody has going forward for this. But it's just wrong. My neighbor is on a retirement income, and their bill's usually $93 a month, and this month, and last month, and the month before, it was over $600. That's not fair. They call to ask for an extension of time. Their power gets cut off the next day. Have they called me? I so, they so, to these public so can I answer your questions, please? Is that okay? Can, I'm really going to ask you a question. I'm well, making yeah. I want y'all to take some do, proactive do you want me action to, help? to get to the bottom of this. So can I respond to your challenge? Sure. Okay. So first, if you do not believe that your kilowatt usage is accurate, 
and please first submit a complaint to the Public Service Commission, demand an energy use audit, and contact my office if you're not satisfied with either. That's the only way to investigate if your usage is incorrect or not. That's the only way. I can't investigate. How do we know they're not manipulating meters? What? How do we know they're not manipulating or smart meters? That's why you have to submit a complaint to the Public Service Commission. Great. So if you're not satisfied with the results of the Public Service Commission complaint, contact my office with your information so we can go over it, and I will spend the time with you to go over it with you. And what um, can you do, sir? Are you going to take it to the governor and the PSC yourself? For, are you going to get the, le the whole legislative would you like? Would you like to respond? Because I'll tell you what I keep doing. What been, I'll, I'll tell you what I keep doing, what I've been doing. If there is anyone with inaccurate kilowatt usage, I've gotten it fixed for them. If it's truly inaccurate, it's been fixed. But you have to contact me if your complaint is not satisfactorily resolved and you still have legitimate, inappropriate kilowatt usage on your readings. How do you fix inaccurate kilowatt meter readings that, that you can't determine? Well, no, I have to prove it. You've got to prove it with evidence. But if, if it's true, and we, we go through so it. I cut everything off and my kilowatt usage doubled. One month triple when I wasn't using anything. So every how do I can I that? right. So so first, how long have you lived in the place? Uh, seven months. Okay, well let's go compare all seven months. I wish I could still get my bills from Delta Power, but I can't. You can't. Can I still do that? Like that that was that was the answer earlier. When I when I, I can help you get those if you can't find them. Um, second, if you know you've been there seven months, so that's not that's not a lot of data to go off of. But, but, have you asked for an energy audit? An energy use audit? I called, I contacted them through the website the one time I could get through, and they wanted to direct me to a cell phone. Okay, so. I don't own the home. You need to demand so an energy use audit. What I can do, but I do know Let me help you demand an energy use audit. Insulation was added. Contact my office, and we will get you an energy use audit, not a self audit. Like, there's, there's a. Test you again. <laughs> 850-462-4776. The call button on my Facebook page goes straight to my cell phone. I'm very easy to get a hold of. Thank you for that. And, and, and I, 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 I can't change an order that's on appeal to the Florida Supreme Court, and you don't want me to, but your concern and issue is something that I can help you with, and it's something that I can apply pressure on to get fixed for you if we can figure out and prove. Why our voice isn't loud? Enough. Thank you. I agree. I agree. You got your two elected officials here answering your questions and issues and responding to you. Y'all need to unite as a delegation for us. Thank you. To. Uh, you know, I used to, sir, I used to work for legislature district three. I was house member legislative On every committee room I went into to help my member present a bill. There was no map that included the Florida Panhandle. We don't exist anywhere yeah. else. Uh, so what does that tell me as a citizen of this county? That we don't matter. We're not even on a map in a damn committee room. Well, that's not true anymore. I don't, I don't know when that was, but I can, I can guarantee you the name of the Panhandle is. Uh, yeah. That's, that's very different now. And you're welcome to come to Tallahassee and visit with me. Uh, I don't want to go back. I don't blame you. <laughs> All right. All right. Any other questions, Trevor? We done? All right. So to wrap up, to go over, just uh, we can talk after. That's okay. It's not about it's not about what I was talking about before, but I think I think what everyone here is saying is basically how many complaints that are outrageous that just happened with when FDL took over. Yep. Do we have to personally send you? to be able to be like the one who resolves all this. No, no, no. Don't so, it's what everyone's saying, I'm not trying to bash you, okay? I'm well, no, I, I know what you're, I know what what you're asking, what can I answer? Saying can is, I respond? Can you guys like unify and whoever you would need to put pressure on to make some momentum somewhere? So to, to, to do what? What is, what is the end goal for you? Well, the end goal is that there would be some kind of commission to actually investigate the fact that so many people all of a sudden are having a wide so, so several decades ago we created an agency to literally their one task is to sue these companies because of that one very reason. Yeah. And then we also established the Public Service Commission, formerly the Railroad Commission in the 1800s, to serve as those judges to oversee this because, it, again, 
It was a trial. There were there was evidentiary hearings all last year. It's called a rate case because it was litigated. They can't get any rate increase or any rate adjustment without that evidence because what, they are getting sued. What can be done? What I'm, what I'm, right. So it depends on what goal. If you want me, if you want me to, to, to empathize with the frustration about this and the rising cost of inflation and gasoline, I'm. I'm, 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 not, I'm not capable of that much empathy, but what I am capable of doing is again, if there's anybody with an inaccurate reading, the first step is to file that complaint because the Public Service Commission's job is to investigate those complaints. The Public Service Commission has that information, the Office of Public Counsel has that information. The vast majority of complaints should be getting resolved by them. The vast majority of complaints, if they're not being resolved by the Public Service Commission, should be getting resolved directly by FPNL. If those, if those two first steps, which are the official steps that are, that are set up by Florida law to address these issues, fail, I'm just the fail-safe. Like, my job is to go, like, back clean up, assuming the system is working. It just sounds like there's too many people voicing the same concern for everyone to then start having to, like, wrestle oh, with this big company and go through all of their rigmarole. Because, you know, like, you know about our personal situation with getting flooded downtown. So these well, that's not, not enough panel issue. We're running up yeah, on time, but what, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. Those drag out forever, so most people just almost they just fall into a ditch and die, and they never get these things. Like that's why my cell phone number is on my Facebook page. I reiterate it constantly. Very easy to get a hold of, and I promise you, if I can, if if we sit down, and the evidence is there, I'm getting it fixed for you. No, but not on it. They're saying not on an individual basis. Well, then, next legislative session, if you can yeah. propose a change to the system, because uh, you, you believe the system's failing, like, bring me legislation. Let's talk about legislation to change the whole system. But that's not going to be a short-term fix. That's going to take a lot, uh, that's a long-term fix that you're not going to see the results from for four years. And I can predict the future. I know exactly what our rates are going to be for the next four years. They go down every single year for the next four years until they match up with the, the, the rates of FPNL in South Florida. Um, but do we want to be the 14th highest rate? Uh, no, rate no. For the for the past decade, I'm tired of being the highest rate payer in Florida. In Florida. No, we've been the highest rate payers in Florida for decades. I'm tired of doing that. So, I, like, we are we are going to go. No, but what I'm talking about is Florida, where I where I have jurisdiction. But this is the problem. We got inaccurate measuring, and then we've got an acquisition. And the acquisition was not handled properly. That's what we're saying here. We were not represented properly. We're being heard. I'm I'm perfectly and fine talking about I'm perfectly fine talking about the monopoly the monopoly system. But again, that's a long-term solution, not a short-term solution. 